This is part two of the Kingdom Protista um, recorded lectures. So the habitat for protozoans um, is almost always aquatic. Um, it can be freshwater or marine. And just in case you don't know, marine means saltwater. Um, and you can also have protozoans in damp soil and, and even snow. But again, these are at least partially aquatic. Um, some are inside of animals or plants where the, the you know, the organism that, that it is acting as its host um, is, has a, you know, a fluid inside. So um, some protists live on dead organisms or their waste and contribute to their decay. Again, that's um, primarily, that's the slime mold. All right. Now, this is a list of the classification for the protozoans, well, for the algae and the protozoans, which are together the uh, kingdom protista. All right. I have to explain this to you because it's a little strange. Um, we learned, in fact, let's do this. Um, this is how we learned classification. Okay, we learned classification in Bio 111 like this. We learned, you remember the sentence, dumb kids prefer spinach over, I'm sorry, dumb kids prefer cookies over fresh green spinach. Okay, so that stood for the classifications domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, the protozoans are in the kingdom, or we, this is, all the organisms we're learning about are in the kingdom protista. The problem is that they're not classified like other organisms. They're not classified, um, they're, there's a little difference in how they're classified. Um, because there's such variety among the protozoans and the algae, and because they are either animal-like or plant-like or fungus-like or a mixture of those, they're grouped into supergroups. And supergroups are kind of in the middle here. And we only use supergroups when we are discussing protozoans. So that's what we're going to be concerned with, with is the supergroup and sometimes even a subgroup of the supergroup. So going back, these are our six supergroups of the domain eukarya. And they contain pro protists and they also contain um, animals, fungi, and plants. So we'll start with the supergroup that also contains land plants. Okay. The land plants are listed here. These are the groups that are in the protozoans. The, the red algae, the chlorophytes, and the charophytes, which are two different types of green algae, and the charophytes are the most closely related to land plants. But the land plants are actually in the group Archaeoplastida, along with the red algae and the green algae. Um, then, if we go up to the top, the supergroup Excavata only contains um, protists, the diplomonads, the parabasalids, the euglenozoans. All of those are from the kingdom Protista. Um, same thing here with the supergroup Chromalveolata, which is divided into subgroups. The alveolates, which include dinoflagellates, apicomplexins, and the ciliates. Uh, the paramecium that we looked at earlier is a ciliate because it has is covered with cilia. Okay, so um, the alveolates and then the other subgroup for the chrome alveolata is called straminopiles, and that includes the diatoms, the golden algae, brown algae, and then oomycetes. And you do say o o, it's not oomycetes, it's o o mycetes. Um, but now the um, and by the way, I, I'm pretty sure I need to look it up, but the, I believe the OMICTs are fungus, but 
you know what, I'm not 100% on that. Just, just let me look it up and get back to you about it. But the diatoms, I wanted to mention them because they are um, the ones I was telling you about that are so beautiful under the microscope. They have a two-part glass shell, um, different colors, different shapes. They can just be really beautiful. All right. The supergroup Rosaria is only Protista, and it includes the Circozoans, the Forams or Foraminiferans, and the Radiolarians. Um, we already did the Archaeoplastida. The supergroup Amoebozoa includes all of these are protozoans, the slime molds, the, the gymnamoebas, and the entamoebas. And then the Opisthoconta include fungi and animals. They include two other kingdoms besides um, Protista. The nucleariids and the coanoflagellates are the Protista that are in the supergroup Opisthoconta. So just remember, these are the six supergroups, Excavata, Chromalveolata, Rosaria, Archaeoplastida, Amoebozoa, and Opisthoconta. And the only subgroups we have that we need to learn are within the supergroup Chromalveolata, um, and they are the alveolates and the straminopiles. All right, so first we'll start with the supergroup Excavata. All the members of the Excavata are in the kingdom Protista. Um, they are named because they all have, they're single-celled, so they're unicellular, And they have a feeding groove that's excavated from one side, and that's where their name comes from. Some of the excavata are predators, some are photosynthetic, and some are, are parasites. The subgroups of the excavata are the diplomonads, the parabasalids, and the euglenozoans. And what you're looking at here is a diplomonad called Giardia lamblia. And if we're using correct um, scientific naming, we underline that because that's the genus and the species name. Um, either underline or put it in italics, and I don't know how to write with italics. But the diplomonads, um, include Giardia lamblia, which is an intestinal parasite. Um, and they exist in anaerobic environments such as the intestines. And um, each cell has two nuclei and it moves with several flagella. So if you go back and look at the picture, you can see that here's one. Here's another one, and here's one, and here's one, and here's one. So there's several flagella that enable it to move. Um, the euglenozoa, which are another subgroup of the excavata, include the euglena, which, which we already um, discussed. A euglena is a mixotroph. It can carry out photo synthesis as well as it can um, consume food from its environment. Um, but this is Trypanosoma brucei. Let me write the whole, because all you can see here is T brucei. Trypanosoma brucei is the name of the protozoan. It is unicellular and it's a parasite and it has two hosts. It has um, one host is the tsetse fly and another host is, <clears throat> excuse me, a human. And um, in the human, it causes African sleeping sickness. So this is an example of a euglenozoa. And another example is, is actually a euglena. So these are two examples in the subgroup Euglenozoa is Trypanosoma brucei and an organism called a Euglena. And just for your, to make sure you remember, this is a Euglena. Okay? 
So Euglena is in the supergroup Excavata subgroup Euglena Zoa. All right, then we have the next supergroup that we study is the um, chromalveolates. And um, the chromalveolates include two subgroups, um, the alveolates and then the straminopiles. Um, there's some information here about the, the um, evolution of the chromalveolates. Um, but it says the down here, the ancestor of chromovulates is believed to have resulted from a secondary endosymbiotic event um, of, of a combination of a red algal cell um, engulfed by an, another cell. Okay, so um, you don't really have to memorize that information, but it's just, just giving you a little bit of information about how they believe the chromovulates evolved. They appear to have lost the red alga derived plastid organelles. In other words, the ones that cause the red color. Um, plastids are, are organelles that store pigment, like a chloroplast stores the pigment chlorophyll. So it's, it says this supergroup should be considered a hypothesis based working group that is subject to change. I love that definition, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> Basically, everything in biology is like this. Up to this point, this is how we're classifying these organisms, but they could change tomorrow. Um, usually, every textbook that I teach in, every time the textbook uh, um, is, you know, is changed, it gets a new edition, there's some kind of a big change in classification. Um, I'll give you one is from the last textbook I taught in to this one, birds were grouped in the group aves, and then now they're actually grouped in with the reptiles. So we have a lot of changes like that happen all the time in biology. Um, as we get more information, we try to try to make it better and more accurate. So chromalveolates include photosynthetic organisms such as diatoms, uh, brown algae, and golden algae, and some also some parasites to animals and plants. And again, they can be divided into the alveolates and the straminar piles. The alveolates are named for the presence of an alveolus. Now, you may or may not know this, but the little tiny microscopic air sacs in your lungs are called alveoli. So an alveolus is just an air sac. It's a membrane-enclosed sac. Um, and the function is unknown in the alveolates. Um, but they are further categorized into the dinoflagellates, the apicomplexans, and the ciliates. And this is a picture of a dinoflagellate. They're pretty interesting because they have a flagella that wraps around their, their midsection. Here it kind of wraps all the way around the back and comes around here. Um, dinoflagellates can be photosynthetic, they can be heterotrophic or mixotrophic. Many are encased in interlocking plates of cellulose. Cellulose is the same material that composes plant cell walls. Um, they have two perpendicular flagella. So the flagella are at perpendicular angles to each other. This is one, and then this is the other one um, that fit into the grooves between the plates. And they have a uh, characteristic spinning motion due to those flagella. Um, dinoflagellates can are responsible for, for causing the bioluminescence that we see in the ocean. They're, um, they're a large part of plankton, what makes up plankton in the ocean. Um, and it doesn't say on here, but dino, there is a type of dinoflagellate that's responsible for causing red tide. Um, it's Alexandria something. <laughs> I can't remember the, the name of it, but I know it's Alexandria something or other. Um, but these are the dinoflagellates that they release when they when there's an overgrowth of these dinoflagellates, they release a red toxin into the ocean and it can affect the shellfish. Um, it can affect um, you know mollusks like clams and oysters and it can affect fish and it can uh, 